You're listening to The Coffee Podcast. I'm Jesse Hartman. The exchange of money for a good may simply be called business, but my human experience tells me nothing is simply business. When two or more humans interact, even from afar, a relationship exists. Today, we hear about relationship-driven coffee with Metrics Xavier Alexander. Let's talk about direct trade, relationship coffee. First of all, do you think those are the same thing? Direct trade, relationship coffee, are they not the same thing? And what is your personal philosophy or the philosophy of Metric about these terms? Yeah, I mean, I don't mind using direct trade. I don't want to be so hung up on relationship coffee, direct trade, because there are companies that you see that audibly and optically have their own sort of classification. They're saying, okay, we're direct trade, but not. So we're going to call ourselves like handshake trade. I mean, that's not (laughs) it. Maybe somebody has a handshake trade emblem and their own certification. But the thing is, I think that people are using it to express that they know where the coffee's coming from. And I think that's fundamentally good. The only challenge is that some companies might be using the language or the relationship of coffee and direct trade, but they've never been to the farms. They've never met the producers. They don't speak their language. They're not inquiring about where's the equity in this coffee. Show me a value chain analysis that extrapolates the farm gate pricing and every other price to know hmm. who benefited where. That is something that whether you're using direct trade or relationship coffee, I would encourage you to think about what does that mean to you? And also further encouraged to ask questions. So if you don't have the ability or the means to actually visit the farms and talk to the producers, then maybe like line up questions about what do you want to know about that person? How do you want to add value to their business? Because essentially all producers are a business. You know, they have a business. They have a product to sell. They put in all of their work and efforts and care and passion into producing this raw material that we then roast and sell at a profit. So then the question I think should be, if you're staying direct trade, then where's the equity in that relationship or in that transaction, right? Well, I think you've touched on something really interesting. So if direct trade, if we say is the same as relationship coffee, which I don't know what the point of separating them is, except for like some philosophical itches that I have, there's this idea in relationships that like, just because it's a relationship doesn't mean it's a good relationship. So there's this, correct. there's this idea when we say direct trade or we say relationship coffee, we're kind of implying like it's a good relationship, right? And so how would you define a good relationship with a person in your life? And I think you could start to outline what that looks like. But one of those things at least would be honesty. Yeah. I think we could all probably agree that honesty is an important marker of a healthy relationship. And honesty and transparency kind of go hand in hand. And I know that Metric has done a lot of work to remain transparent. Do you feel like that's, am I on the right track here? Yeah. What do you think about these things? No, absolutely. I mean, I think it's important. The challenge is sort of the barriers to transparency is that it's so complicated because we're dealing with numbers and data that we can publish. But then, you know, if you're looking at the commodity pricing today and then sort of weigh that against a direct trade price, which would be, or relationship price, whatever you want to call it, to a producer, that is optically better. So let's just say, for example, like C market price is $1.50 and then you're paying $5 FOB to a producer, which is like, wow, that's insane. That's a great price. And it can be, no doubt. The challenge there is that there's so many other variables that are hard to extrapolate to consumers because you could have a $1.50 coffee that could be equitable, which sounds crazy. But like if you're having a producer that has 200 hectares and is vertically integrated and they have their systems in place, their fixed and variable costs are so controlled because they know how to produce a lot of coffee for cheap. Whereas the smaller ones, their pain points are that the amount of coffee they can produce. So, you know, again, you have one that's 200 hectares, could do 20 containers of coffee, and then you have a small producer that gets paid $5 and they're only producing three bags of coffee three bags. So yeah, they're making money at $5, but it's also their cost of production might far exceed the FOB price. 
So that's the challenging thing. And even as I'm saying this, I'm like, it can sound confusing if somebody that's new to coffee doesn't understand that dynamic. And also for consumers, they're straight up not asking those questions. Consumers are asking for what is on trend, I would say. It's like you have some roasters that are roasting really delicious coffees, like Panamanian geishas. They cost you know, a ton of money. Awesome. Great. But you're dealing with producers that are really well funded. They are not people of color. They went to school. They have some big degrees and coffee is a different business. And I'm not knocking that. We have bought coffee from the likes of people like that. It's totally their business and they can do really, really good coffee. But it is definitely not the same as buying coffee for a smallholder that's only producing three to five bags of coffee per harvest. And even at a better price, it's still not enough. So that's, I mean, we could do a whole episode of just this one question, just to, so you know, but it's, it's challenging, you know, it's really challenging. So we have those questions. How do we achieve a better price? It's just having communication. That's number one, just as you would in an actual loving relationship with your spouse or friend or anyone else. You have to ask, like, where can I meet you? That's what it is. Where can we meet you? And that's always how I start these conversations with the producer. We work with. So as we talked about going for that healthy relationship, coffee. <laughs> mm -hmm. Relationships are messy. Yes. Have you run into any mess with this business philosophy of relationship-based business? Oh, yes. Yeah. There's been a lot of situations where we work with producers who have delivered stellar coffees. I love them. I, they're like family, but then they have gotten themselves into some sort of financial pickle that has them really just reaching out for money. That's like, hey, can you help me here? Can you pay me a better price this harvest and I'll give you a break on the next one, you know, just so I can cover these bills. And then they just keep digging themselves in a hole and then quality falls. So that's really challenging when we're put in a position where some of the producers we've worked with view us as, you know, like, hey, they're like a bank. They have this money. And I have had to explain to them, it's like, well, so how it works for us is that we work with an importer to finance and do logistics. This is a direct trade relationship, but they're financing it through their banks. So we don't release the funds. They release the funds and then we pay them. And we have done the other way around where we pay the mill up front and then they ship the coffee straight to our door. But by and large, for cash flow purposes, we utilize importers to do the financing and logistics. And that's really what they do really well. So they have insurances and they're professionals at that. Mm -hmm. So we let them do that so that we don't run into other issues. But yeah, some of the relationships we have, they're not understanding of that. So it becomes more like, yeah, but if you could just give me money and I have to then say, I want to help you, but we also have a business. We also have costs. And when we have these honest conversations around transparency, I remember once I told this producer, it's like, oh, you know, we buy their coffees at around $5 FOB and then we sell it. I forgot how much, but let's just say for the purpose of our conversation, it's like, oh, $25. And their eyes just went wide. It's like, wow, that's a lot of money. Why don't I make more money? And it's like, well, let me explain that there is that price, but also I have to pay for importing, for transporting to the Midwest. It's a different fee. There are these fees that are aggregated after FOB that really just bring our price up. So we're not earning as much as people might think we do. There is profit, yes, but also we utilize that profit to reinvest back into the business because we don't have a piggy bank. We don't have a investor. So that's how we stay scrappy is just to take those profits and put them in areas of need. And also the other thing too, is that while we have grown, we're not a massive roaster. We're not doing 20 containers a year. We're still relatively small. People think we're really big, but we're not. We're actually quite small 10 years in. And so for how much we pay our staff and how much we cover insurance and XYZ, the amount we pay relative to the price we sell it at is pretty fair, I would say. So we're not gouging, but it is a really challenging conversation when you're having real transparent conversations around money with producers. And I would say by and large, most really understand. They totally get it. But others are like, no, oh, but you're selling it for this much. Why don't we get paid more? I want to pay you more. I always endeavor to pay more for the coffee. It's just a matter of the economics and the challenges to 
putting a product of Honduras or Colombia in the market that costs five dollars more than the most expensive one in the market is really challenging. So there's always competition, right? We don't want to be incredibly expensive. We're not those people. I think we're there in our pricing, but it's a challenging thing. I could again, that's that, that also the question I could talk for another hour or two. Yeah. Yeah. It's not very fair of me to just like lob these questions over. <laughs> no, no. I, l- I love these questions. They're great. You could probably sense the conflict in my own yeah. tone because I have frustrations. I'm just like, man, I really just, if we could pay benchmark pricing $10 for all the coffees, no matter its cup score, that would be awesome. But at the end of the day, our competitors are not doing. And so I'm not trying to look at our business. It's like, everyone else's competitor and, you know, screw them. Like, no, we want everyone. If you're in coffee, do it and do it well. Be passionate, be driven, be transparent. And that's what I would ask of them. But again, not everyone has that goal and approach to coffee. A lot of people we meet, their goal is just like, I want to make money. I don't care about anything else except making money. And that's whatever. That's fine. Those are not our people. I really love companies that are really looking to really help redefine what relationship coffee and direct trade means, which for me, it means knowing your producers, understanding their cost of production, understanding where you can add value to their business and meeting them where you can, but also letting them know I can't always meet you at a $9 FOB price for an 85 plus coffee because I have baristas bringing coffees from really hot shot roasters from all over the world. And they are expensive, right? But they're not paying those prices. And that's fine. Not a knock. I love it. I want people to taste coffee and do coffee really well because it helps our industry. We should all endeavor to pursue quality and deliciousness. But also, I guess, where's the equity in that product? How do we know the people that were involved in this process and this effort, how are they taken care of? And that's what I always ask. But Yeah. Mm. Xavier, I think you brought up that you have this conflict in you. Yes. It made me think this thought that gently held conflict is what we can call tension. And I feel like tension is a good thing because tension is like, to me, the word picture is like, you have these things that seem at odds or in conflict, but if you can hold them, you can work them out and there's that tension. And if you can hold that tension, you can learn. Yeah. And I feel like you're doing that work. And so I hear you working out and you're, I mean, you've laid out really complex variables, right? One of the things you mentioned earlier was this idea that equitable price is almost a moving target because it really depends on the producer. And that alone is a really complex variable that requires that holding of the tension of, okay, what does it mean for me to pay this business partner in a way that is good for them and good for us? Yeah. That's harder than just being like, I'm just going to pay you a price. I pay everybody. Right. Yeah. So you got my mind spinning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm, a, yeah. Well, so we're both spinning then. Yeah. That's good. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, the, but this is good because this is, The purpose, you know, that's why I really appreciate what you do and asking stellar questions because it not only makes me think, but I hope it makes anyone who's listening to our conversation really consider some of the things you and I are discussing today because they are as important to me as they are to you, which is why I think we're having a really great conversation here. And a goal of mine is to inspire that one roaster that has a two kilo Ambex sitting in the garage and they're not sure where to start getting copies and they're just going to start calling around and connect with a reputable importer that really cares about the cooperatives they're sourcing coffee from or any smallholders and is able to place that coffee in that small roaster's hand to kickstart their journey into not only roasting and serving delicious coffees, but to also one day travel to origin and meet the likes of Benjamin Paz or Jose Rivera or the likes of people like Azahar in Colombia who are doing amazing work in the field of transparency and equity and be able to forge those relationships with them and learn more about relationship coffees, like what it means. Producers really get a kick out of that visit every year. You know, for me, I've been an introvert. I always feel like weird getting into somebody's house and then having them focus on me. But that 
focus for them means stability and means that they know you're coming. They know I am committed to that relationship and that we are not treating them in a way that's like, well, if you don't deliver an 86 and a half coffee this harvest, we're not buying it. Or if we buy it, we're going to buy it at this lower price. Like that's not how we do it. We have conversations where we sit down and I've done this many a times where we sit down. I talk about my family. I talk about my kids. We share photos. We take photos. I play with their kids. We talk. We eat farm chicken. We will drink a local beer. We will then get in the conversation about pricing and how it's been this harvest and really just get to the nitty gritty of like what's happening now, what's happening in this moment and where can we meet you? And that for me is really important because a lot of times other companies, roasters, et cetera, may not have that type of relationship. For them, it doesn't look like that. There's a language barrier. They're not sure how to communicate with them. So they have to use a third party or they never go at all. They just take the word of other people. And there's a lot of reputable people that you can take their word for face value. But I think it's still important to hold the different actors in the supply chain accountable. Accountability is extremely important to transparency. If there is no accountability. You could say whatever. They can tell you whatever and you can promote whatever price you want because nobody's asking. Nobody's asking to see your contracts. Nobody's asking to see any value chain analysis in it. That you know why they're not asking is because they don't know to ask. So then that's why I really appreciate what you do in having me on today because I get to share that sentiment with you. And I hope that it inspires that one person out there or five or a hundred people to say, I want to learn more about this. I want to learn more about how to be a better partner to our partners at Origin. How can I make a difference in my own community? And then the beauty of that is that once you understand what it all means, you can use that as a marketing opportunity to let your customers know that, hey, we paid a higher price for this coffee. We lovingly roasted it. We lovingly sourced it through our, our import partners, so, 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 whoever they are. And we really are excited about this product and we hope you love it too. And that's what's going to help get people more connected to the product. It's just education. It is public education is key to helping people understand what's happening in our conversation. Because I feel like, you know, we don't want to gatekeep this. This is not something we need to gatekeep. It should be open source. It should be shared. It should be extrapolated. It should be broken down. It should be vetted. It should be looked at. It should be proven wrong and rebuilt again hmm. to make a difference, I think. It's a good word, Xavier. Yeah, thank you. We are coming to a close on our conversation, and I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all of our guests these days on the Coffee Podcast. This first one is, what are you working on, and how can our listeners be a part? Oh, boy. Several things, but I'll keep them brief. So we're opening <laughs> our new location in Avondale, so we're going to have an all-day cafe. Yeah. Thank you. All-day cafe. We're eventually going to have an evening program. We're going to Bring in a wine component. So we're really excited about that. So we'll have some food, wine, beverage, and obviously coffee. We'll have a roastery. And so that's happening now. And my, my spouse is actually a part of it too. She's spearheading the food program. So really proud of her. Just kind of name dropping Kirsten, you know, because she's awesome and she's doing a great <laughs> job. Really proud of her. So that's happening. We are also working on another source code too, which is a magazine project. This project that we dropped about two years ago during the pandemic that basically kind of walks readers through the supply chain. It explains not every single factor in the supply chain, but it basically sort of lightly touches on what certain things mean within the supply chain. So yeah, that happened. And the second version is going to be more editorial. Nice. We're going to interview members of the supply chain. So small, medium, and large producer, small, medium, large cooperative or in the mill owner and exporter, importer, roaster. We're looking to do that hopefully by the end of the year. And the third and not final thing, we're working on a million things, but I'm also working on a book. I actually have a meeting today about my writing partner, Andrea Brito Nunez. So she works for Azahar and she also was a, cool. a writer. She helped me with source code when we first launched the source code magazine. So her and I are working on a story that's centered in magical realism. So it's actually, it's going to be an illustrated story 
that we're going to put music to. And it's centered around a coffee. So that's like, cool. uh, I, for me, it's like really cool because it's like this farming family in rural Colombia is going through these challenges, uh, producing coffee. And then, you know, the main character Facundo, his father leaves, like emigrates to the States to find field work here because farming is not equitable. So they had to abandon farming back home. And his grandfather being sort of, you know, this man who always tells, as people would say, tall tales, told his younger grandson Facundito about the story about this magical seed that exists in this other realm that only can be found through this magical compass. So anyway, so that's, Sounds that's really the story cool. that's, that follows, you know, like this young child going into the high jungles to find this portal into this other dimension to find this farm and bring that seed back to plant it because that magical seed basically produces the world's best coffee. So that's the story and that's what we're working with. Yeah. yeah that's really cool. Yeah. Those are not yeah. small projects. You, you said no. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty ambitious, but you know, I think that that ambitious comes by being inspired by the people I keep around. Nice. They inspire me to keep pushing, be motivated because I think by nature I can be you know, I go through depression, I go through anxiety, I go through a lot of things that I think a lot of us can relate to. So working towards in making positive changes or doing something positive that is not just for me, blesses me and makes me feel good. But also I see that this is something that I'm doing good to others or for others. And not just me, but all of us collectively are achieving this mission of equity and doing things that are creative and fun and uh that's, uh, I don't know, I feel my, my heart and mind, they're full, you know, like, in the, and I'm happy. So that's nice. That's good. Yeah. Now we're coming down to our last question here and you can pick one of these. So I'm going to give you three questions. You can choose yeah. which one you want to answer. So what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? What is the main takeaway you want our listeners to have from this conversation? And the last one, what is the most important thing you have unlearned recently? And that idea is you held a belief that you had to let go of, and that's the process of unlearning. Mm. Boy, they're all really good. I mean, I feel like drawn to the third one because I think the summer has been a transformative summer for me. I would say not, well, professionally, yes, but also I think in my own personal life, I would say that. Maybe this might be TMI, but I started therapy over the summer and it's something that I've been, I'm just a stubborn old mule or horse, you know, like I just <laughs> never thought that I could need to talk about my past and trauma. And so I started doing that and I've realized that in doing so and having these admissions and coming to terms with the way that I see the world and how I treated others is that I have not only have had it all wrong, but also like in having it all wrong and having a different lens, I've hurt people that are the closest to me because of just, again, the, my body language and just being a little too stoic, which I think that's just how I am by nature. But like really just, I don't know, being more aware of myself has been really important to me. So I would say that that has been transformative for me. And I would encourage anyone listening if you're in a position where like there's, you know, we all have stress. We're in this world. We are in the world, right? So like coming to terms with your own self can be hard. So it's important to reach out to, even if it's not through therapy, but it's good to reach out to people that you can talk to. Like talking to you today and the questions you asked me, I mean, maybe this is weird to say, but it's kind of like therapy, right? It is like therapy because I get to wrestle with these emotions in in a format that is going to be listen to, you know, and that's not how therapy works, but I hope that whoever's out there can be encouraged by that, can be encouraged by like, hey, I can seek professional help to make sense why I feel this way. And I think that in doing so, professionally speaking, it inspires you to, I don't know, just do better and to be more connected to doing good things to other humans. Because this is going back to what we both have said, it is the human condition, you know, like, Coffee is very human. There's a lot of hands to go through it. It goes through so many steps to become the final product. And so, you know, like I think just being aware and connected and being in touch with 
how vast and how wide and how deep this goes is beneficial. So yeah. Thanks for sharing, Xavier. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yep. Really good conversation. What do you think? Does relationship coffee or direct trade mean anything to you personally? You can now share your thoughts directly with the Coffee Podcast audience. If you listen to Spotify, just go and find the episode and there's a little Q&A area that you can click into and share your thoughts. Remember, you can take advantage of the 20% off code COFFEEPOD to buy up some delicious coffee for a limited time by going to Metrics website. You can find the link in the show notes. Thanks to Ryan Ingerson for his hard work on the background research for this conversation. For now, as always, and until next time, happy brewing.